no climate change policy Order. to protect Senator one Green. single Time job. Time for the contribution has expired. Order. I'll allow senators to take their seats. That was a good warm-up. Um, Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Yesterday, the minister refused to accept that it was wrong to hand Nadia Seavright over an illegal robo-debt uh, when she was eight <coughs> months pregnant. Kath Madgwick's son, Jared, was issued a robo-debt under Mr. Morrison's illegal scheme. Jared tragically took his own life after reading a letter from Centrelink about his robo-debt, and Ms. Madgwick believes the letter, quote, tipped him over the edge. Does the Prime Minister now accept it was wrong to hound vulnerable Australians like Jared as a result of the illegal robo-debt scheme he designed and implemented? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Um, as I've indicated uh, to the Chamber yesterday, uh, we received advice at the time that the government, that the program was put together, uh, that it was lawful. Many governments have, in fact, used ITO averaging data over many years, Labor and Liberal. Services Australia makes $180 billion in payments every year. Uh, and uh, as I've also put on the record in the Senate yesterday, Ms. Plibersek, Mr. Shorten and Mr. Bowen have previously supported uh, debt recovery uh, in the context of overpayments having been made. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. <coughs> Rachel is a 64-year-old woman living in a remote Aboriginal community. Her son passed away in tra traumatic circumstances in 2018. The next year, Centrelink sent a letter to her son's estate demanding payment of $3,300. Rachel then received a letter to her late son asking him to verify his employment records from five years earlier, leaving her distraught. Does the Prime Minister believe that Rachel deserves an apology? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. I refer Senator Keneally to my first answer and to the uh, statements by Ms. Plibersek, Mr. Shorten, and Mr. Bowen in support for debt recovery in relation to these payments. Order. Uh, have you conclu he's concluded his answer, Senator Wong. I'll call Senator Keneally for a final supplementary question. Does the Prime Minister? Does the Prime Minister think the suffering experienced by Rachel, Jared? and more than half a million Australians was worth it. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. I refer Senator Keneally to my first answer. Order. Senator, order. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Cormann. Can the minister inform the Senate how Australia's economy is leading the developed world in its recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic-induced economic crisis. The Minister for Finance, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President, and I thank uh, Senator Brockman for that very important question. Uh, Mr President, the uh, Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development has released a very important report overnight, uh, which shows the devastating effects uh, of COVID-19 and the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, is having on the world economy. Importantly, what the OECD report shows is that Australia is leading the developed world in our economic recovery from the COVID-19 crisis. The OECD expects economic growth in Australia to rebound to dis despite the global economy facing, and I'm quoting the OECD, the deepest recession since the Great Depression, with the loss of income exceeding any previous recession over the last 100 years outside wartime with dire and long-lasting consequences for people, firms and governments. Uh, the OECD is forecasting global growth to fall by at least 6% in 2020, and that is in the absence of a second wave of infections. To put this in context, global growth fell by just 0.1% in 2009 during the so-called global financial crisis and is now forecast to fall by at least 6% as long as we can avoid a second wave of infections. According to the OECD, the outlook for Australia is the third best among all OECD members. The OECD forecast for Australia's for GDP to contract by 5% in 2020 before bouncing back to 4.1% growth in 2021. Australia's economic outlook for 2020 compares remarkably well with other countries. The United Kingdom is forecast to contract by 11.5%, France by 11.4%, 
Italy by 11.3 per cent, New Zealand by 8.9 per cent, Canada by 8 per cent, the United States by 7.3 per cent, and indeed the OECD average uh, is the OECD average Order, contraction Senator of 7.5 per cent. The answer has expired. Senator Brockman, a supplementary question. Mr President, and thank the Minister for the first answer. Can the Minister inform the Senate of the dangers to our economy if a second wave of COVID-19 hits Australia? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Yes, I can. The OECD report makes it very clear that the economic consequences of a second wave of infections would be dire for both the Australian and the world economies. In the event of a second wave, the report said the global economy would likely contract by a further 1.6%. The Australian economy would, would contract by a further 1.3 per cent. That means our economic contraction would jump from 5 per cent to 6.3 per cent under the second wave scenario, which would be an extra $25 billion blow to our economy. But it wouldn't stop there. A second wave would also hit our forecast recovery in 2021 by 3.1 3, by 3, uh, per cent, which would mean an $80 billion blow to our economy over two years. That, is, that would cost thousands of Australian jobs. That is why every Australian has a patriotic duty to do everything they can to help minimise the risk of a second wave. That is why every Australian must heed the health advice and not attend mass protests at this time. Order. Senator Brockman, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister inform the Senate about what else the OECD has said about Australia's response to the COVID-19 crisis? Order. Order. I'll call Senator Cormann when there's silence. Senator Cormann. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I thank uh, Senator Brockman for that supplementary question. The OECD has praised Australia for acting quickly to close our borders and put in place the necessary health restrictions, which helped us to successfully flatten the curve. The OECD had praised Australia for its massive macroeconomic support. That economic support was only possible because we entered this crisis from a position of economic and fiscal strength. Growth was increasing at the end of last year. Unemployment was falling in February. We had returned the budget to balance for the first time in 11 years. Because of that strength, we have been able to provide support of $260 billion, or 13.3 per cent of GDP, in support of workers, households and business. There is still a long way to go in recovering from this once-in-a-hundred-year global pandemic but we're heading in the right direction. It is important that we remain vigilant and that all Australians do everything uh, they can uh, to uh, avoid a second wave of infection. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Internal Centrelink documents show that the government ignored warnings to Services Australia <coughs> as early as March 2016 of a, quote, major risk that automated Centrelink robo-debts could be inaccurate. Throughout 2017, the government ignored warnings when the Administrative Appeals Tribunal repeatedly found that the basis on which robo-debts were calculated was wrong and unlawful. On what, date, on what date did the government first become aware that its robo-debt scheme was illegal? The Minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, Senator Kitching, for your question on this matter. Um, can I state at the outset of this question that, given that this matter is currently before the courts, I am extremely mindful that anything that I might say could have legal implications, and so I cannot Order. provide any further comment uh, in specifically in relation to uh, anything in relating to the legal uh, aspects of this matter. But what I can say, what I can say, is that this government is acting to repay these people. Uh, and in fact, uh, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, the Minister for Government Services, uh, Stuart Robert, did a press, uh, a press conference on the 19th of November last year, where he made an announcement that the intention of the government. Uh, was intending to pause its debt recovery using income averaging as its sole reason for raising the debt. Senator Kitching, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The Attorney General has claimed that the government had legal advice supporting the robo debt program designed by Mr. Morrison during his time as Social Services Minister. It has been reported that the only advice was about procedural fairness under administrative law from a junior legal officer. 
Is this correct? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And I draw the senator's uh, yeah, draw the senator my uh, answer to the previous question in relation to any comments that I uh, intend to make, or for that matter, not make in relation to uh, this particular matter. However, what I would say, um, following um, my response to the primary part of your question, is that. Um, Last November, we did make changes in relation to this particular program uh, on the back of uh, the decision by the government at that time that we would cease uh, pause, or pause the recovery of debts in relation to the income compliance program. But I think the most important thing that's worth the chamber uh, um, understanding is that um, since my time as the, the social services minister and, 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 it, and also during the time uh, that uh, Minister Fletcher was the member of the Minister for Social Services. We also embarked on some significant reforms in the social services area um, in relation to single touch payroll uh, and also um, for the change of assessment Order, model. Senator Rustin, time has expired. <coughs> Senator Kitching, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. It was reported yesterday, yesterday that the total value of unlawful debts issued under the scheme may total $1 billion. How much exactly will the government's failure to listen to the warnings about Mr Morrison's robo-debt scheme cost the Australian taxpayer? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. And once again, Senator Kitching, um, as I have said to the answers to the principal question and the first supplementary question, I will be not making any comments in relation to this matter uh, because it is currently before the courts. Um, however, as I said, uh, as I was uh, attempting to, uh, to advise the, the Senate um, of some very positive initiatives that have been put in place uh, in the last 12 months in relation to making sure, first and foremost, that people don't incur debts in the first place. And by using technology such as single-touch payroll and the change of assessment model, which sadly Order. won't be able to come into play uh, on the 1st of July as a previous, but hopefully we'll get it in in August, to make sure that Australians um, who are reporting income are reporting their income accurately because we give them the tools to do so. Because by simplifying the model by which people are able to report income, we hope to be able to reduce the amount Order. that people are incurring in debts. Order. Order. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Can the Minister update the Senate on the state of the government's health response to the COVID-19 pandemic and how Australia is leading the world in health recovery? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Chandler for your question. Mr. President, over the last few months, Australians have worked together to suppress COVID-19 giving us time to prepare our health system to live with the virus. As a country, we have used this time well, sourcing additional ventilators and personal protective equipment and making plans for our hospitals to respond to a surge in cases. We have, as we know, expanded our testing regime, developed our capability to respond quickly to new cases and outbreaks, and we've improved our ability to identify quickly people who may have been exposed to the virus. Working together, we have now reduced the number of people in hospital with COVID-19 to 20, and the number of people in ICU because of COVID-19 has now been reduced to three. Yesterday, there were only seven new cases reported across the whole of Australia, four new cases in Victoria and three new cases in New South Wales. Mr President, as we know, on 8 May, the National Cabinet agreed to a three-step plan to gradually remove the COVID-19 restrictions and for all of us to move towards the new COVID-safe economy. While Australians can, of course, see that road back, it does not mean that we cannot remain vigilant. We need to, in particular in observing social distancing practices. We now have seen 1.6 million tests conducted across Australia. Of those, 7,276 Australians have been diagnosed with COVID-19 and, sadly, 102 have lost their lives. But the rate of positive returns has now dropped to 0.4 per cent across those 1.6 million Senator Cash, tests. Senator Chandler, a supplementary question. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister advise the Senate why it is important to remain vigilant in following public health directions during the COVID-19 pandemic, and what are the risks of failing to remain vigilant? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, it is critical that we remain vigilant to ensure we do not risk further outbreaks. That just happens to be our reality as a country. As the Chief Medical Officer has said, make no mistake, this virus is still in our community. The OECD research today has made it abundantly clear. The risks of a second wave are real, and a second wave will have both profound health and economic impacts. The OECD does expect Australia to rebound, despite the global economy facing the deepest recession since the Great Depression. The OECD's outlook for Australia is the third best amongst all 36 OECD nations. But a second wave of COVID-19 infections would wipe out four years of economic growth in Australia and expose highly indebted mortgage holders to possible mass defaults. Senator Chandler, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, what steps can Australians take to minimise the risk of a second wave? Senator Cash. Mr President, we cannot throw away all of the sacrifices and hard work that we have made collectively as a nation together over the past few months to contain the virus. It is critical that all of us, every single one of us, continue to ensure we do not put the lives of others at risk and the livelihoods of our family, our friends, but most importantly, the most vulnerable Australians. We all need to ensure that we exercise an abundance of caution and follow the medical advice on the additional and practical steps that we all need to, to take, including staying 1.5 metres away from other people whenever and wherever possible, maintaining good hand washing, uh, coughing, sneezing, hygiene, staying at home if we're unwell and getting tested if respiratory symptoms um, we have them or a fever. We have shown what we can achieve together. Order. Senator Let's Cash, not time throw it has away. Expired. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. New South Wales and the Northern Territory have become the first jurisdictions to restart pokies. Prime Minister Scott Morrison announced gaming venues could possibly be allowed to open as part of Step 3 by July. Australians saved $3 billion since the pokies have shut with many gamblers forced to go cold turkey with their pokies addictions. The money saved had been spent in other areas of the economy rather than lost down poking machines. Advocates against gambling harm are concerned about the significant health risks of restarting the pokies during such a vulnerable time. Does the government share these concerns that a resumption of pokies will lead to a rise in gambling-related health and social harm? Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you very much, Senator Griff, for your question. First and foremost, can I say the government takes um, the gambling harm that may be caused to Australians very, very seriously. Um, we're certainly aware of the recent um, reports that people might be um, going back to their pre-COVID uh, gambling habits despite the social distancing requirements that exist within uh, gambling venues. And we're also uh, aware of reports um, from analytics consultancy um, Alpha Beta and the credit firm Illion on changes to people's gambling habits during the first few months of the corona pandemic. It is for this very reason, uh, in the protection of Australians and, uh, and gambling, that the Australian government embarked on a program of reform within the gambling sector to put in place the National Consumer Protection Framework um, to make sure for, for online wagering. And it's very much the centrepiece of Australia's um, gambling reforms, because we want to help make sure that consumers are protected no matter where they are in Australia. And it also provides a framework that empowers Australians um, through the use of tools to make sure that they control their own behaviours with their online gambling habits. Um, so we take very, very seriously. Uh, making sure that Australians have got the tools that they can protect themselves. But what I uh, would say, um, Senator Griff, is that um, state and territory governments have the primary responsibility uh, for licensing and regulating land-based gambling establishments to which you are largely referring in your primary question. 
obviously, um, as the federal government and through many of our agreements and, and the relationships that we continue to have and probably have, in, have been enhanced over recent times with our discussions with our state and territory counterparts, we are working to make sure that through this unprecedented time that we find ourselves in at the moment, that we are working together to put in place protections to make sure that we can assist Australians to get to the other side of this pandemic. Senator Griff, supplementary question. Uh, Minister, the uncertainty caused by COVID-19 has triggered many mental health problems in our communities, particularly amongst at-risk gamblers. Now, last year, the Senate backed my motion asking the federal government to address gambling as a national public health issue, noting the links between gambling, family violence and mental ill health. Has the government given any further consideration to the motion that was passed by the Senate last year, and if not, why not? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, um, Senator Griff. Um, and, and of course, um, motions passed in this place, the government takes them all very seriously. Uh, but one of the things that has been, um, I think, very important in the delivery of your, um, your request and your desire to make sure that greater assistance was put in place for people um, who find themselves with a gambling addiction um, uh, has been twofold. One has been the recognition by this government through the COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic of the greater need for assistance and support and financial resourcing um, of our mental health services to make sure that those people that find themselves in a, a position where their mental health is being impacted on by how the coronavirus um, pandemic has been impacted them have got the research um, and the support that they are able to uh, they need to be able to help them. The other thing that we have done is also provide a significant um, increase in the amount of money that's been made available uh, to financial counselling services uh, and also making sure that people are aware where those services are available so that they can also assist Order. them through Senator this time. Rustin. Senator Griff, a final supplementary question. Uh, Minister, the current GST distribution, and I know you, 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 you may have uh, to take this on notice, effectively penalises states which choose to take action against gambling interests by not recognising any change in their fiscal capacity. Will the government undertake to work with the National Cabinet to ensure that states are not penalised for public health and social services initiatives which address gambling harm and reduce taxation revenue? Senator Rustin. Uh, well, th thank you very much, Senator Griffin. Thank you very much for giving me uh, uh, the answer to my question during your, uh, the question that you were actually asking. Um, of course, um, matters in relation to GST are matters for the, for the Treasurer and the Finance Minister, and I am not going to uh, seek to make any commentary about that. But what I would say and reiterate is that this government takes very seriously our responsibilities to work with all jurisdictions to make sure that people who are impacted by gambling-related harm um, have the supports in place, first of all, to be able to assist them through things, uh, as you, we mentioned in the previous question, mental health, but also the support so they can deal with their addictions uh, and the harm that they are causing potentially to themselves and their families through their addiction. Uh, and we will continue to work with the states and territories. We will continue to work through the National Consumer Protection uh, Framework. We will continue to work through the National um, Exclusion Register to make sure that we continue to make advances in this area so that we can continue to protect Australians who are at risk of gambling-related harm. Senator Green. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Today, the member for Leichhardt called for Mr Morrison to extend JobKeeper, saying, and I quote, there is a very strong argument and the figures that were released today show you how important it is that we continue to have this support within our community. Will Mr Morrison give this support to communities in far north Queensland facing Australia's first recession in 29 years? Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr uh, President, and I thank Senator Green uh, for that question. Uh, our government uh, has made uh, responsible decisions right from the outset uh, of this uh, crisis. We've made decisions to save lives and to save livelihoods. And we'll continue to make those decisions. We'll continue to make responsible decisions moving forward. Uh, the Senator will be well aware of the Treasury review that has been well and truly uh, publicly canvassed. Uh, once the findings and recommendations of that review uh, are received, the government will be making further uh, responsible decisions. And I can reassure uh, the uh, people of North Queensland that our government is very, very focused on their best interests. And of course, the most important thing that the people of North Queensland would like to see right now is the removal of state borders so that the planes can start flying again, so that the tourists can Order. go to North Queensland again. 
And if you were interested Order. in the people of, if you were interested in the best interest of the people of North Queensland, you would be calling on Premier Palaszczuk Order. to remove those state borders. Order on my right. Now on my left. I'll call Senator Green when there's silence. When there's silence, I'll call your colleague, Senator Watt, Senator Wong, Senator Colbeck, Senator. Order. I will call Senator. We are wasting time for non-government senators with constant interjections. Senator Green. A survey of 2,300 Australian company directors found, and I quote, 81 per cent would prefer to see a cautious phasing out of stimulus policies such as JobKeeper, rather than a rapid wind down. Why is the government refusing to give Australian businesses confidence that JobKeeper will continue past September where needed? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, businesses across Australia can have uh, confidence that our government will continue to make responsible decisions uh, to, put, to save lives, to protect Australians from the risk uh, of a second wave of infections, to, 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 minimise the risk of a, to minimise the risk of a second wave of infections, and to also ensure, to also ensure that we can Senator have the strongest Pratt. possible economic recovery on the other Senator side. Senator Pratt. As the OECD has uh, clearly uh, outlined in its report released overnight, uh, Australia is leading the developed world when it comes uh, to the economic recovery uh, in the context of this coronavirus crisis, and we'll continue to make the decisions that are required, and businesses around Australia overwhelmingly know that. Senator Green, a final supplementary question. The OECD, the RBA Governor, 2,300 company directors and the government's own backbench are calling for the JobKeeper program to be extended beyond September. How many Australians will lose their jobs because of Mr Morrison's stubborn insistence that JobKeeper snap back in September? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, the OECD has said that Australia is leading the developed world when it comes to the economic recovery in the wake of the coronavirus crisis. And, and the OECD has also predicted a bounce back in, uh, in economic growth in Australia in 2021. Uh, 2021, uh, which, 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 uh, and the, the OECD has also outlined that the comparative position of the Australian economy is uh, materially better uh, than the position of economies uh, in many other parts of the world. We'll continue to make the decisions that are required, uh, including decisions to minimise the risk uh, of a second wave of infections, because that is so important uh, to protect people's health, and it's also so important uh, to protect our economy and to protect jobs. Uh, and I say it again: if Senator uh, Green uh, is committed to the best interests of the people of Queensland, she will join the coalition in calling uh, on Premier Palaszczuk to uh, remove those state border restrictions in Queensland so that people from the great state of New South Wales can go on holidays in North Queensland, can Order. spend money in North Queensland. And Order. In the Order. Order on my left and my right, Senator Cormann, on a point uh, th of order. Th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, President. Point of order. Point of order. I, I think. I think. I, I think. Uh, you know, uh, interjections are always disorderly. But if interjections are made, they should at least be directly relevant. Uh, and I don't know how <laughs> South Australia would be directly order. relevant to a question about Queensland. Order. I give. Um, that wasn't a point of order, and I might say, and I might say that the interjections were coming from across the two main sides of the chamber and not from the far end. So I call on those on my left and right. Senator Hanson Young. Th thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Senator, does art matter? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Yes. Um, Senator Hanson Young. If art matters, uh, I've got a supplementary question, um, yep. Senator uh, Hanson Young. If art matters to this government and the Prime Minister, why has the PM not used the words art or artist since the COVID crisis started? How many times has the Prime Minister said the words art or artist since the crisis started? 
How many times has the Prime Minister uttered the words football, footy and construction? Senator Cormann. Um, th th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr President. Uh, I don't think it would surprise Senator Hanson Young uh, that uh, I uh, will uh, have to uh, take that very important question on notice so that I can provide uh, an accurate answer uh, to uh, that forensic uh, question about a very important matter of public policy. Senator Hanson Young, a final supplementary question. Thank, thank you, uh, Mr President. Is it true that the arts and recreation industry employs 50 per cent female workers, while the construction and building industry is only 14 per cent. Does this government believe arts jobs matter, and do they believe women's jobs matter? Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Of course we, uh, this government believes that uh, women's jobs uh, matter. Uh, before the COVID crisis hit, we had secured record, record female workforce participation in our economy, the best ever, uh, and indeed the gender pay gap was the lowest ever. The lowest ever, and that is on the back of, of course, uh, our uh, national economic plan for uh, for growth, for stronger growth, and indeed because of the leadership provided by a number of distinguished and outstanding uh, senior uh, cabinet ministers, including, of course, uh, the minister uh, for women's interests, Senator Payne, and, pre and her predecessors, who have who have done outstanding work in promoting uh, the uh, the cause and the women's economic interests in the context of our government. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Southeast Asian nations like Taiwan quickly learned with regard to COVID that they just had to isolate the sick and the vulnerable, and that allowed healthy and productive people and businesses to keep working and earning money. The result is that their economy in Taiwan and other Southeast Asian nations remained healthy, and they had far fewer deaths than Australia. Minister, was there any consideration given in April, in April to changing Australia's COVID strategy when Taiwan and other Southeast Asian nations had already proved that their strategy worked and was far superior to your government's strategy? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, when the crisis hit, there's no question that we considered a whole range of alternative options on how best to respond to it, but uh, in making decisions and in making judgments, we were guided uh, by the advice of relevant uh, experts and uh, you know, in relation to how best to deal with the health threat. Uh, we were guided uh, you know, principally by the advice of the Australian uh, Health um, uh, Principles Protection Committee, uh, the chief uh, medical and chief health officers from around Australia and uh, the Commonwealth. And um, I think it's fair to say, and you know, for a range of reasons, but uh, you know, the, early, the early decision to um, impose border restrictions in terms of uh, non-residents who'd spent uh, the, uh, any time over the previous 14 days in mainland China, uh, not being able to come to Australia and imposing quarantine requirements on uh, Australians and permanent residents, uh, having spent uh, time over the previous 14 days in mainland China, has you know, demonstrably helped delay uh, the spread of the virus, giving us time to prepare, uh, both in terms of the um, hospital capacity uh, to deal with the potential inflow of patients, but also to prepare the risk management uh, processes that would best equip us uh, to save lives by suppressing, uh, slowing down and suppressing the spread of the virus and helping to put, of course, the economic support measures in place. Well, I mean, every single death uh, is, uh, is tragic and it's uh, one more than you would like to see. But uh, again, I mean, comparatively speaking, comparatively speaking, um, the number of deaths in Australia is uh, very low internationally. Uh, the number of infections is very low. Uh, the number of uh, community transmission is uh, extremely low right now. And uh, you know, we, we believe that, by and large, uh, our strategy has worked. Now, I mean, this is not a perfect environment. I mean, you know, you, you, you are presented with, we were presented with a rapidly evolving crisis situation. We made the best possible judgments in the circumstances, guided by the expert advice. On balance, I believe that Order, we, we have made good decisions Time. as a country. Senator Roberts, supplementary Thank you, question. Mr. President. I acknowledge Senator, Senator Cormann's statement, uh, but he fails to acknowledge that the, the economy has been devastated as a result of the government's strategy when other economies have not been devastated. Minister, hasn't your government's COVID strategy put the Australian economy and many Australian small businesses and jobs at unnecessary risk and less, left us with a debt we had to have? Senator Cormann. 
Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. It is certainly true that we were forced to impose significant sacrifices on uh, many Australians. Um, you know, we put uh, we, the restrictions that we had to put in place as a country on the uh, economy uh, in order to save lives by slowing down and suppressing the spread of the virus uh, has imposed, of course, uh, significant burdens on many businesses and on many working Australians. That's why we put in place the uh, economic support package that we have in order to, pro to provide, to keep as many businesses in business through the transition as possible, to keep as many working Australians connected to their employer uh, during this transition as possible, and to provide enhanced support to those Australians who, through no fault of their own, lost their job because of the coronavirus crisis. Now, uh, you know, you can argue whether one decision or the other decision could have been uh, made differently, but if you look at the outcomes, if you look at the actual outcomes, both on the health front and on an economic front, I think that Australia is in a very good position, comparatively Order, speaking, to other countries around Senator the world. Roberts, a final supplementary Thank you, Mr question. President. Minister, everyday Australians want to know how the Prime Minister will ensure that if businesses do close or go into liquidation, that receivers and administrators will ensure that Australian jobs are preserved and that affected businesses can only be sold to Australians first and not be cheaply flogged off to foreigners. Senator Cormann. Um, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, um, you know, in relation to um, foreign investment, uh, you'd be aware that the Treasurer has put in place some temporary uh, measures to ensure uh, that uh, Australian businesses are dealing with the consequences and the impact of the coronavirus crisis uh, are protected as appropriate in the context of any attempted foreign takeover. Uh, but um, you know, in, in a broader sense, in a broader sense, when we, of course, focused on doing everything we can to, to maximise the strength of the economic recovery on the other side. And let me also say that on the other side, in order to maximise the strength of the economic recovery, we will um, need to rely uh, on uh, foreign investment uh, into the future to maximise uh, our economic uh, growth opportunities into the future. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Yesterday, the minister said, and I quote, I will not rule out adjustments at the end of the review. This morning, Mr Morrison guaranteed that JobKeeper will remain until September for industries other than childcare. Who is correct? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, both those statements are correct. Uh, and, and in fact, I mean, like, they don't understand the English language, uh, seemingly, Mr President. I mean, I've made this point over three and a half hours at the Senate uh, COVID committee the other day. And I've made the point yesterday. I mean, and I've said it in the media on I don't know how many occasions. Yes, the JobKeeper program is legislated. That's a statement of fact. The JobKeeper uh, program is legislated for six months. We've also said that uh, there is a review uh, which uh, was always scheduled to take place about halfway through uh, into the uh, operation of the JobKeeper program. Uh, I can't preempt uh, you know, what the findings of that review uh, will be, which I have not yet seen. I can't preempt what the recommendations may or may not be. Uh, indeed, whether there are any recommendations at all. But what I can tell you, what I, what I can tell you is that the JobKeeper program is legislated and will be in place for the six months, uh, which we've all said. And that statement, that statement you are attributing, the statement that I made about uh, adjustments that may be made, uh, is not inconsistent with the statement that the JobKeeper program will be in place for six months, which it will be. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Morrison also said this morning that the review was and I quote, about how you're implementing the program. There's a lot of administrative issues and things like that. Was the review directed to only consider implementation and administration, or is it open to the review to recommend that JobKeeper will end early for some industries? Senator uh, th Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, as I've also indicated publicly, uh, we don't have any uh, proposal in front of us. We're not considering any uh, proposal. We're not expecting any proposal to end the JobKeeper program uh, for any other sector. In relation to childcare, it was a, it was a specific. It was a specific. It was a specific. Uh, it was a specific proposal that was initiated by the sector itself because there was a better, fairer, more equitable way to provide transitional support uh, to that industry, given the uh, activity levels across childcare centres had significantly increased again. Uh, the reason the reason JobKeeper was uh, put in place for uh, the childcare sector was in the context of a drop in activity levels. The childcare subsidy was no longer generating revenue. With uh, activity levels going back up, there is of course now a capacity to generate revenue, government revenue, through childcare subsidies as well as government, uh, as well as uh, parental contributions, as well as transitional 
uh, a transitional payment of $708 million by the government. Uh, so, I mean, what we're doing here is entirely appropriate. I mean, All you are arguing Senator that we Coleman, should keep child the care answer free has forever. Expired. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Given it took only three days for Mr. Morrison to break his promise to keep JobKeeper until September for childcare workers, can Australians trust Mr. Morrison's promise today? And will Mr. Morrison rule out breaking his promise to other workers? Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, President. I completely reject the premise of the question. Australians know that they can trust the Prime Minister and the Morrison government that we will do everything we can. We, 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 will, we will do everything we can to avoid a second wave of infections, and we will do everything we can to maximise the strength of the economic recovery on the other side. And, and, Senator Wong. and, and the Australian people know, the, the Australian people are relieved that they don't have a socialist, anti-business, anti-growth government in government right now to deal with this crisis. Senator Abet. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Can the minister update the Senate on the importance of Australia's relationship with India and how is the government strengthening our bilateral ties? The minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Abetz both for his question and particularly his interest in this matter, given that he is the Australian patron of the Australia-India Alliance. What the Morrison government is doing is delivering on our commitment to deepen Australia's relationships with key partners in the Indo-Pacific. India is, of course, the world's most populous democracy and a rising economic and strategic power in our region. And last week, Prime Ministers Morrison and Modi held a virtual summit, India's first uh, indeed, a landmark moment in the ties between our nations. Australia and India agreed and announced that we will elevate our relationship to a comprehensive strategic partnership underpinned by democratic principles, the shared promotion of the rules-based international order and the preservation of an open and inclusive Indo-Pacific. In a time of what are great global challenges, it's more important than ever that countries such as Australia and India come together to reinforce our common values. A new joint declaration on maritime cooperation signals the commitment of Australia and India to a rules-based maritime order in the Indo-Pacific, which is founded on respect for the sovereignty of all nations and international law, particularly the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. The partnership will strengthen maritime domain awareness and increase cooperation on major transnational challenges such as people smuggling, arms and narcotics tra trafficking, uh, climate change, terrorism and illegal, unregulated and unreported fishing. Our partnership is grounded in strong people-to-people -people links and the invaluable contribution of Indian migrants to modern Australia. Uh, as a proud resident of Western Sydney, I can tell you that uh, Harris Park would never be the same without the contribution of our Western Sydney Indian community and so many vibrant parts of the Indian diaspora in Australia. Senator Betts, a supplementary question. I thank the minister for that extensive answer and ask, can the minister advise the Senate of other key outcomes of the virtual summit between Prime Minister Morrison and India's Prime Minister Modi last week? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And the Australia-India Comprehensive Strategic Partner Partnership is a major and significant reflection of the relationship between our two countries. And it takes our relationship to a new level of practical cooperation, reflecting both the depth and the breadth of our mutual interests. In addition to the CSP text itself, we've signed eight substantive agreements that will strengthen technical cooperation and create new opportunities for Australian businesses. We'll work more closely than ever with India to build our ties in mining, in critical minerals, in vocational education, training, water resources, public administration, science and technology and defence. And with Minister Reynolds, Minister Reynolds, the Defence Minister, and I are very pleased that we've also agreed to Foreign and Defence Minister 2 plus 2 meetings at least every two years. And Australia is just the third country to join such meetings with India, along with Japan and the United States. Senator Abetz, a final supplementary question. Minister, how will further cooperation between Australia and India on cyber affairs and critical technologies advance our strategic interests and provide new opportunities 
for Australian businesses. Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Last week, uh, Minister for External Affairs Jay Shankar and I signed a new landmark Australia India framework agreement on cyber and cyber enabled critical technologies cooperation. This arrangement will create opportunities to strengthen our technical and economic linkages with a technically aspirational India. A new Australia-India Cyber and Critical Technology Partnership will create a research and development fund for our businesses and researchers and support other countries to improve their cyber resilience. Australia and India have a shared vision for an open, free, rules-based and secure internet. And importantly, this will also ensure that cyber and technological cooperation will sit at the core of our new comprehensive strategic partnership as we forge a dynamic Australia-India 21st century relationship. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Last week, it was reported that only 4 per cent of Australians living in bushfire-affected communities have been able to access government support. Why? The Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Thank you very much, Senator Watt, for his question and his obvious ongoing interest uh, in, in the bushfire-affected areas of Australia. Uh, the specific question that he has asked me, um, I'm going to have to take on notice uh, because I do not have uh, the necessary information in relation to the 3 per cent uh, number that he is quoting. However, um, it, while I have the opportunity to actually add something in relation to the government's response uh, to the bushfire affected communities in Australia, and, and we recognise that it has been a very, very traumatic time for those people that have been affected by bushfires, because obviously on top of that they have had to endure the, uh, the coronavirus pandemic impacts that all Australians and all Australian communities have had to endure as well. So, uh, but what I would like to do is to assure all bushfire affected communities that they have not been forgotten um, and that I acknowledge that the recovery in many areas has been hampered by the COVID pandemic. Um, but the government is focused on addressing bushfire relief and recovery needs with flexibility and, uh, and speed, and, and that is why the Prime Minister himself announced on the 11th of May this year a further $650 million Order. in assistance to, uh, in addition to the $2 billion bushfire recovery fund, which I might say has already been fully committed. A billion dollars of this fund has already been delivered and is working to support the locally-led effort in response to the bushfire impacts on the ground in these communities, including in my home state of South Australia and particularly uh, in the Adelaide Hills and the Kangaroo Island area that were so particularly devastated by the two fires that uh, were in, uh, took uh, hold in South Australia over the Christmas New Year period. Um, and when you add that to the expenditure that, uh, from existing measures, this means around $1.4 billion is rolling out across our drought, uh, our bushfire affected communities and supporting individuals within those communities. Senator, what a supplementary question? Thank you, Mr. President. Stephanie Stanhope lost her home in the Bega Valley on the 4th of January 2020. Struggling to navigate the system, she said, and I quote, for all the assistance you were led to believe was going to be there, it isn't. Not long after it happened, there was a call from someone in the system saying that each person would be given a mentor to guide them through the process. I've had one phone call. How can we expect bushfire victims like Ms Stanhope to access the system when there's no one to help Order. them navigate Senator the system? Watt. Senator Rustin. Mm. Thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you very much, um, Senator Watt. Um, as I've often said in this place, if you have individual examples of people who have concerns, whether it would be in my area of social services or whether it would be in other areas um, that I represent, order. I am more Senator than Watt, on a point of order. The, the question is not about an individual example. The question is why. There was order. An I, I'm going to hear the point of order and then I'll rule on the point of order. Senator today. Watt. So the point of order is relevance. The question was about why bushfire victims like the example can't access the system. Senator, Senator Watt, I have repeatedly ruled that the part at the end of a question is not the only part of the question. The minister may be directly relevant by being directly relevant to any part of the question. The minister is being directly relevant in this case because you did quote a specific example. Senator Wong. Mr President, uh, it is the case that you have 
and I think correctly indicated that. Order. I'll, let me hear the point of order. <laughs> Even when I'm being nice, you'll mean. Really. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's harsh. Order. Oh, wounded. I am wounded, Eric. All those years at the table. Um, <clears throat> it's, oh, now that's me. Um, we still got a day You to have go correctly this week. ruled. Uh, you have you have ruled, and I, I would indicate we believe correctly that you know, direct relevance can pertain to different aspects of the question. But the, this minister can't get out of answering anything by simply saying, "Oh, you've mentioned an individual." No, the that is not the test oh, well, of direct relevance, and that is the way in which she is using this tactically. She should answer the policy point if she doesn't Senator, wish to talk about Senator the individual. Senator on a point of on the point of order, Senator Cormann. Th thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. On the, it was it was a, a very a broadly introduced question with a range of mothers uh, canvas and the minister was clearly being directly relevant uh, to the question asked and and let, and as, uh, as presidents of both political persuasions uh, have uh, ruled uh, during the time that I've been in this chamber Order, the Senator president Wong. is not in a position to tell a minister how to answer a question. Oh, the president can only require direct relevance, and the, and the minister was being directly relevant to the question so, asked. On, on the point of order, several, several points. Firstly, I re reiterate without restating what I said earlier. Secondly, Senator Wong, the minister had only been speaking for 16 seconds, so I'm not in a position to rule on the entirety of her approach. Um, I have said before, and I restate again, that when very specific questions are asked requiring facts of ministers, the term directly relevant will be strictly applied, as I have done. However, I've also said before that to be directly relevant, a minister can directly refer to or address, including challenging material or assertions contained in any question or preamble. The minister was being directly relevant by addressing that part of the question in the 16 seconds for which she'd been speaking. Finally, there is a time after question time where the merits of answers can be freely debated. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, well, first of all, um, I would reject the premise that uh, if you're referring to an individual and then you move to talk about a particular action, um, that that I should think otherwise that you're actually referring to that individual and their their experience. You were talking about people getting access to mentors, and you're referring to Stephanie. Now, I don't know whether the person you're referring to or other people um, have had access to these particular mentors. I assume they have. Uh, and I'm more than happy to find out for you, Senator Watt, um, as to the, the merit or otherwise of the accusation that you're making that because the person that you're referring to hadn't had access to a mentor, a mentor, it meant that everybody didn't have access to a mentor. But what I would say is this government takes very Order, seriously— Order, Senator Rustin. Senator Watt, final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Last week, Mr Andrew Colvin from the National Bushfire Recovery Agency admitted that there was too much confusion around the bushfire recovery system, and the current system was, and I quote, effectively re-traumatising individuals. Why is this government failing to deliver the promised help and instead re-traumatising individuals? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Senator Watt, for your supplementary question. Um, the government obviously um, is very focused on making sure that we protect all Australians during this particular time, and that includes those people that have been impacted by bushfires. And, uh, and I would say that the, uh, the programs that have been put in place, the substantial programs that have been put in place for the bushfire support measures, are in going a long way to assisting Australians who have been impacted by bushfires. But as I said to an answer to my previous question, we acknowledge that there has been um, the recovery has been hampered in some areas because of the impacts of COVID. Um, and, but that doesn't mean to say that the ex extensive programs that have been put in place uh, to take up uh, the bushfire recovery efforts uh, have not been very, very significant. I mean, the small business support that was put in place by Senator to cash, you know, grants up to $10,000 that people were able to get access, the small business grants of up to $50,000 uh, for many within the, the local government areas that have been designated. Order, Senator Rustin. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister outline how the Australia-India Comprehensive Strategic Partnership will benefit Australia economically? especially regional agricultural and mining communities in their post-pandemic recovery. Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. 
Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Canavan for the question and for his long-standing commitment to, uh, to the deepening of the Australia-India relationship. Um, can, I, uh, can I acknowledge with that that uh, his work, indeed, as uh, part of the many pieces of the puzzle that led, as Senator Payne has outlined to the chamber already, uh, to the successful signing of the comprehensive strategic partnership uh, between Prime Ministers Modi and Morrison last week, uh, and has helped to drive India to the point of being Australia's fifth largest export market. It is a significant relationship for us nowadays, and I was thrilled, Mr. President, earlier this year in February uh, to lead a delegation of some 60 businesses, 20 universities and 10 peak industry and research organisations to India, focusing across different fields of food and wine, agribusiness, resources, education, infrastructure and tourism, reflecting very much the fact that in, uh, that in 2019 Australia's resources and energy exports to India uh, were worth almost $13 billion, with metallurgical coal feeding India's ambitious uh, steel manufacturing targets, as well as amounts of gas, gold and copper uh, helping to fuel India's development as well as supporting Australian industries. Uh, our government is equally delivering on growth strategies in the agricultural sector, with training on biosecurity treatments to improve the flow of agricultural products between our two countries. The Australia India Council has funded Pulse Australia to produce regular guidance notes to better forecast Indian demand for agricultural commodities, and we're developing a grains partnership. We've extended the Australia India Strategic Research Fund with $15 million over the, through to 23 24 to pursue deeper economic engagement through collaboration in science and innovation. This includes sharing our mining equipment, technology and services expertise in the Indian market, once again helping to grow our economy and India's economy as part of a strong, strategic and mutually beneficial partnership. Senator Canavan, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. How will, Minister, the partnership with India help grow our nation's rare earth industry? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. The coalition government takes very seriously the development of Australia's critical minerals industry, and, uh, and Senator Canavan, uh, more than anybody else, I'm sure, in, uh, in this place, uh, has contributed uh, to that focus, including the joint announcements that Senator Canavan made uh, in the development of Australia's critical mineral strategy uh, and the new financing measures to help build the critical mineral sector. Our comprehensive strategic partnership with India includes an MOU on cooperation in the field of mining and processing of critical and strategic minerals to increase the flow of trade, investment and R&D in critical minerals, including rare earths. We have taken a significant step towards establishing ourselves as a reliable supplier of the critical minerals needed to grow India's manufacturing sector and its defence and space capabilities as we seek to grow our own. And the Critical Minerals Facilitation Office has regularly engaged with their Indian counterparts to highlight Australia's potential as a reliable supplier of rare earths elements, and the MOU will strengthen that ongoing dialogue and trade. Order. Senator Canavan, a final supplementary question. <coughs> thank, you. thank you, Mr President. How, how will expanding our trade relationships with other markets help secure long-term and well-paying jobs for regional Australians? Right. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, uh, the opening up of Australia and expansion of our trade relationships has uh, helped to fuel the very strong job and economic position that Australia was in going into the COVID-19 pandemic, and it will be crucial to our success and our rebuilding and coming out uh, of these circumstances. Around one in five Australian jobs now depends uh, on trade, and under our government uh, we have seen an increase of more than 18 per cent in the number of Australian businesses who export goods to the world strong growth equally in the services sector and in both of these areas we see real potential for stronger growth in the India relationship. Our grains industry, our red meat industry, our sugar industry all appreciate the importance of uh, the international rules-based system and the opening up uh, of those markets. And if we look uh, at Senator Canavan's home state, beef exports from Queensland have increased 40 per cent in the past five years. Fruit and nut exports from Queensland have gone up significantly, horticulture and elsewhere, all as a result of these stronger Order, trade Senator relationships. Birmingham. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. Oh, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, the minister, minister, Senator Cormann has, on I think six occasions uh, in a number of questions over the last two days, declined to indicate, express regret or offer an apology to people who are, have been the victims of the illegal robo-debt scheme, including Nadia Seafright, 
uh, including Kath Madrick and including Rachel, who was referred to today. Can the minister explain his refusal to offer regret on apology when the Prime Minister has just now apologised in the House? The minister representing the Prime Minister, um, Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr uh, President. Well, and that is appropriate for the Prime Minister to do so. Um, the service, services, services Australia, Order. As, I've, as I've indicated, Services Australia makes $190 billion in payments a year. Uh, we received advice at the time as a government that the program was uh, put together, that it was lawful, and many governments indeed have used ITO averaging uh, data over many years, Labor and Liberal, and indeed Ms. Plibersek and Mr. Shorten and Mr. Bowen uh, have um, previously indicated that it is, appropriate, uh, to, it is appropriate to seek to recover debts, but of course it should be made uh, in a lawful, it should be done in a lawful fashion. And as I've indicated yesterday, as I've indicated uh, yesterday, uh, of, course it, uh, it should, of course it should not have happened in a way that was unlawful. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my supplementary is this. Can the minister explain why it has taken so long for the Prime Minister to offer this apology? And can the minister explain why he is refusing to repeat that apology in this chamber? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Order. Mr. President. Well, I mean, as the Prime Minister has said, as I understand it, the government has great regrets about any pain or injury that has been caused here, and, and we're making it right. And that is, of course, exactly right. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Are you kidding? <laughs> Mr. President, thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister explain why the Prime Minister failed until today to do the decent thing and offer an apology for those who are victims of a scheme he designed and implemented uh, as Minister, Treasurer, and then Prime Minister? Why did it have to be dragged out of him in question time after a court has found against the government? Senator uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, President. The Prime Minister, of course, speaks for the government, and the Prime Minister has made the government's position perfectly clear, as have I in this chamber. Thank you. So, further questions, we place on the notice paper. to take note of answers. Senator Pratt. Madam Deputy President, this afternoon I rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Cormann and Rustin to the questions asked by Senators Keneally, Kitching and Wong. Well, on display today and ever since this scandalous robo-debt was put in place back in 2016, we have seen the parlous state of this government's morals on display. No regret or apology from the government about this issue until today, and still none from the finance minister or none from uh, Senator Rushton, who has had to oversee this program. You know, every inch of the way, time and time again Order. in this place, this government came in and tried to justify uh, averaging, income averaging over the ATO and comparing that uh, to the properly reported details that people reported to um, Centrelink as a justifiable way of issuing and raising debt notices. Hundreds of thousands of these debt notices have been sent, and I, like many others, and I'm sure it happened to you opposite as well, have had people in tears about these debt notices calling our offices. People demonstrating profound mental health impacts because of these debt notices. And what did I hear back from the government? Well, if you don't owe a debt, you've got nothing to worry about. But that was far from the case. The onus of proof to prove you didn't owe a debt was on you. That is a breach of any debt policy and any debt law around this country where debt collectors aren't supposed to be able to come after you unless they've got legitimate proof that the debt is owed. Now, Centrelink, this government had no legitimate proof that these debts were owed. Why? because they calculated these debts on a completely spurious basis. 
Senator Cormann said, oh well, uh, the opposition went in government. They used to use uh, ATO information to issue debt notices, and indeed we did. But we had a pair of eyes, human engagement, to work out whether the debt was valid or not, whether it had been properly calculated. And even then, people had a proper process where they could have how their debt was calculated explained to them. Now, I myself sat on the phone with Centrelink officials asking them, how did you calculate this person's debt? And they refused to say how they had done it. They simply refused to say how they had calculated someone's debt. They refused to say that actually what we've done here is averaged out how much you earned that financial year and used it to calculate whether we think by averaging that out you would have been eligible for um, income support over that time. Now, the simple fact is someone is entirely entitled to income support. You say, for example, at the first half of the year uh, you're working, so say from July uh, to October you've got a reasonably well-paid job and then you lose your job. Maybe you get a little bit of casual work after that. And then for the rest of the financial year you're on income support. Now what Centrelink did is they took that money that you earned in the first half of the financial year, they averaged it out and then they said, we think you might have been claiming payments. Uh, we think you've got a debt. Not that we think you might have been making payments. They said, here is your debt notice. Here is the notice that says you owe us money because you improperly uh, claimed payments from us. And if you think otherwise, please bring us your pay slips, bring us your bank statements and prove it to us that you don't owe the government money. This is spurious and outrageous and it is absolutely incredible to me that it has taken until 2020, when this bad behaviour started back in 2016, for this government to be properly called out on it. And what? It took the courts to do it. Not the blatant unfairness, not the complete lack of morals in, in, and the mental health impacts of this policy on people. No, you had to have the, the issue go to court. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Your time has expired. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, that was um, a wonderful exercise in rewriting history, near enough to fantasy, because as we try and paint recipients of the assistance of the Australian taxpayer in their time of need as victims, we forget something really important, and that is that assistance from the taxpayer comes with it a set of obligations. So when someone makes an application for income support, let's say it's for uh, or any kind of income support payment really, they're told two really important things. One is that you've got to report your income and you've got to do it every fortnight. You've got to report Order. your income. Order. And Senator you've got Pratt. to do it every fortnight. And they're told if their circumstances change, <coughs> they need to let Centrelink know. And they're told, and they're told that if they fail to do so and they end up overpaid, a debt will get raised. Now, the people who have received these notices weren't just sent a debt collector to go and knock on the door. Yes, there was a computerised exercise of matching ATO records to what people had reported by way of income, an observation by that process that they didn't match, and in doing so, a process of averaging through the year was used. It turns out that wasn't the world's most accurate process. But it remains the case that the income support recipient has the obligation to accurately report their income. And if they're doing that, they're not going to end up with a problem. If they get a notice through this data matching process, as occurred in this case, it asks them to provide evidence of their income. If they engage with that process, as is their obligation, then they're not going to end up with a debt. 
there's going to be an accurate assessment of these things. But if we're talking about people who stick their head in the sand, people who refuse to engage with their obligation to provide information to Centrelink so that the taxpayer can be um, supporting those people in the measure reflected by law, then there's going to be a problem. Obligation is a two-way street. And those who receive support from the Commonwealth have to do their best to make sure accurate information is reported, just as the Commonwealth has to do its best to make sure we're assessing these things accurately. Now, I won't have Senator Pratt stand up here and um, take note of the questions today and pretend that there is some moral objection from the Labor side to the use of a computer-based measure to match the income reporting data with employment data for Centrelink recipients, because it is false. And I can direct those opposite to so many examples from their own ministers when they were in government in which they expressed support for precisely the same thing. So let me direct Senator Pratt to a few examples. From Mr Shorten, the automation of this process will free up resources and result in more people being referred to the tax garnishy process, retrieving more outstanding debt on behalf of taxpayers. Mr Shorten didn't have a massive problem with the idea that we should recover debts using a computer-based matching program. How about Mr Bowen? Mr Bowen had some things to say about this. He says, when, when he had responsibility for this area, it is important that the government explores different means of debt recovery to ensure that those who have received more money than they are entitled to repay their debt. So Mr Bowen is OK with being responsible on this front. Mr Bowen is OK with people being required to repay excess benefits that they receive from the taxpayer because income hasn't been properly reported. And what about this? from Ms Plibersek. If people fail to come to an arrangement to settle their debts, the government has a responsibility to taxpayers to recover that money. Again, an uncontroversial concept, but those opposites seem to forget that that is exactly what they argued for in government. Well, we're not ashamed to say that we're going to do the right thing by the Australian taxpayer. We're going to make sure we support those in need, but we're also going to make sure that those who are overpaid repay their debts. And all the bleating in the world doesn't thank you, change Senator that Stoker. responsibility. Your time has expired. Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, two points that seem to come through in Senator Stoker's uh, uh, five minutes is a set of obligations. Where was the government's obligations and where is the government's obligations in terms of dealing with this matter immediately? And heads in the sand, I, I would suggest uh, uh, that perhaps those opposite need to have a good look at what that actually means. It seems the inability to say sorry and mean it runs deep in the coalition's DNA. We've heard and continue to hear heartbreaking evidence about the impact of the government's damaging and, as it turns out, illegal scheme. So why not apologise to the people for imposing this terrible scheme on them? We've heard evidence that it has cost some people their livelihoods, homes, families, peace of mind and even their lives. It is, it is shameful, it's unconscionable that not a single person in the government's ranks can say the word sorry. You cannot admit you were wrong to hound the families of deceased people demanding payment. You cannot admit you were wrong to inflict a bureaucratic nightmare on people and try and force them into repaying money they didn't have for debts they did not incur. You expect people in trauma to answer the questions about circumstances from years ago and threaten them with debt recovery action straight away if they don't answer immediately. Yet this government, the minister and the prime minister, will not even answer the most basic questions about how this illegal robo-debt scheme was designed and implemented. The minister has dodged and ducked, thrown up flimsy claims of public interest immunity and just plain refused to answer questions about robo-debt. 
have a look at the transcripts during our Senate estimates, how many times we have tried to pursue this line of questioning. Have a, lo have a look at the transcripts of our community affairs inquiry and how this line of questioning is never one that is answered. The Prime Minister does need to step up and answer the questions about how robo-debt came into being and when the government was first made aware that what they were doing was illegal. The Prime Minister does need to answer the question about how much this botched robo-debt scheme is going to cost Australians in reality. It's now been suggested that the true value of all the debt notices unlawfully issued under this scheme will exceed $1 billion, not the $720 million the government promised last month it would repay to the 373,000 welfare recipients that received the unlawful demands for money. Since 2015, a total of $2.1 billion is estimated to have been raised through the robo-debt program. So what about those gaps? between what the government says it will repay, what we now learn it will probably end up repaying, and how much they've actually raked in under this unlawful scheme. What exactly is the government considering as lawful and unlawful debts, and how are they deciding this? The government won't answer any of these questions, and let's make it clear what is happening here. The government hounded and harassed Australians for debts that they had not lawfully incurred, and they will now repay some of the money they gouged from people. They will spend hundreds of millions of dollars on this exercise. And I'm not talking about even the potential fees, the legal fees and damages payments that may arise from ongoing legal action against robo-debt. I'm also not adding into this what the government's paid out to the debt collection firms for hounding and harassing Australians into paying these false debts. The previous senator speaks about how these debt collection firms weren't knocking on doors. Well, I would say there'd be different stories out there from Australians who've got their own way of telling what and how they were made to repay these debts. It has been a complete fiasco. And the depths of this fiasco has yet to be thoroughly examined. It seems every day there are more and more revelations about the complete and utter disaster of robo-debt. And the government knew this. It knew robo-debt was wrong. It knew it was disastrous. It knew it was harming vulnerable people and families. Yet it kept on trying to shake them down. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you. Madam Deputy President, uh, look, the government takes its responsibility in administering the welfare system incredibly seriously. Uh, it is a hallmark of uh, Australia's system that we have such a safety net, a $180 billion safety net, that is there for people when they need it most, whether they're unemployed, uh, maybe they have a disability, uh, any circumstance that they find themselves in where they're not able to uh, earn uh, money for themselves at that particular time. And so that safety net is absolutely critical, and the integrity of that safety net is also important. And this is why the Australian government takes this position very, very seriously. We spend $180 billion to support Australia's social safety net each year. Recovering overpayments is a fundamental part of our welfare system. When someone has a debt, when someone has a debt, the government is legally obliged to pursue recovery of that debt. This debt recovery process has been a feature of our welfare system for over 30 years. It's not new. It's not something that just started as it sort of is made to, uh, be, as, as it's been sort of uh, uh, put here today. This is something that's been going on for a long, long time because it's part of the integrity of the system. If someone has been overpaid, if someone has a receipt of a payment that they maybe were not entitled to, it is the legal responsibility of the government to ensure that that debt is recovered. Now, the Australian taxpayer expects us to ensure the integrity 
of the welfare system. Because for about a month of every person's work every year, about a month of their salary goes into funding the welfare system. So for the first four to five weeks of every year that we work, that taxpayers work, that's funding the social services welfare safety net that Australians would come to rely on. It's absolutely critical. So there is an expectation upon us, upon this government, to ensure the integrity of this system. Australians rightly expect that the government is resolute custodians of these taxpayer funds and to work diligently to prevent and recover overpayments. In November last year, changes were made to the way debts were raised as part of the program. And from that time, debts were no longer raised wholly or partially using the averaged ATO income data. Income averaging was a core feature of the income compliance program. Averaging was applied where recipients did not engage to explain actual discrepancies identified between income they had reported to Services Australia and the income data from the ATO. Now, I was part of the, uh, one of the days of the, uh, the committee that had a look into this program, and I heard evidence of, uh, uh, from people. And one of the evidence, uh, one of the evidence that I heard was from, the, uh, from Services Australia, who explained the process of what was actually taking place. Now, firstly, a notice was sent to uh, the recipient that there may, in fact, be an error. Uh, there may in fact be a discrepancy in the amount that they've received compared to what the ATO, compared to what Services Australia understood to be the amount that they should have received. Now it wasn't a debt notice. It wasn't a debt notice. It was simply uh, a letter that went to them to say there is these two differences. Uh, there's the amount that you've received, and there's the amount that we expect uh, after averaging, after looking at the data, that we think uh, you should have received. And there was an invitation for that person to be able to engage with Services Australia to explain and provide other evidence to show that maybe the, estimate, uh, the estimation was wrong. Uh, so it wasn't just debt notices sent out. There was an opportunity for people to speak to a human. Senator Pratt spoke earlier, said, you know, it was just a computer doing these things. Well, it wasn't. There was an opportunity for people to speak to someone over the telephone or even in person to go into Centrelink and have a chat about the situation. Now, the government is remedying this situation. Uh, payments have been made and refunds back to people uh, and will continue to work through this program to ensure that the integrity of our welfare system is intact so that we can ensure that taxpayers who expect us to keep it intact are confident that this government is responsible with those taxes that those people pay. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Senator Green from the lectern. Thank you. Um, it's funny, isn't it? They, uh, we, we've heard an apology today in the House from the Prime Minister, an apology of sorts, um, I would call it, on this robo-debt scheme, but it seems that the members opposite didn't quite get the memo uh, because they don't really seem very sorry. Uh, they still seem particularly uh, defiant and particularly um, uh, proud of what they did um, under this scheme. There's not even a sprinkle of sorry from the uh, senators opposite. And maybe that's because they weren't communicated to on this apology today. Uh, but I believe that the reason is because they aren't apologetic at all. This decision brought about by court action against the government um, is a win for 470,000 vulnerable Australians who will be repaid what we thought was $721 million, uh, but looks like it will be upwards of a billion dollars now. Talk about economic management from the government. This was a dodgy scheme launched by Scott Morrison when he was Treasurer. Ministers Stuart Robert and Ru Minister Rushton, Minister Porter, all had a hand in the scheme as well, and they should apologise uh, as well. RoboDebt relied on ATO income averaging data to issue debt notices to people who were in a weaker position to de defend themselves when they received those letters. It's interesting to hear members opposite talk about the ability for someone to, to pick up the phone and just call Centrelink and everything will be fine. 
if you've ever had to stand in a line at Centrelink or call Centrelink, you'll be very aware that uh, this government's put staffing caps into um, Centrelink and a lot of labour hire um, jobs have been used to fill the gap. Um, the call wait times just keep going up and up. We've heard for many estimates now over years and years uh, that not only did they issue this robo-debt scheme, but they also made it harder to get help when people needed it from Centrelink. But I want to talk today about the uh, effect that this had in North Queensland, because we do know that in Townsville debt notices were being issued, were being issued by this government in the aftermath of the 2019 floods, despite assurances that debt collection was not being pursued. I want to put on record my, my thanks and appreciation to the Townsville Community Legal um, Service, particularly uh, the principal solicitor there, Michael Murray. I, uh, it was about a year ago now that I travelled to Townsville and met with Michael and his team, uh, who were some of the first people to identify uh, debt notices being sent through to Townsville residents in the aftermath of the floods. And maybe it was that issue that really uh, personalised this uh, terrible, terrible scheme uh, for many people in the community, because there's something about floods uh, that has a unique, um, uh, a unique impact on people when they're sent a debt notice. When they're sent a debt notice where the onus of proof has been reversed and they are the ones who have been told that they need to prove that they do not owe a debt, go and get pay slips for the last five years, go and find information. People in towns were being sent these notices even after the floods had destroyed their homes and destroyed their records. How were these people, how were these people were supposed to prove that they didn't owe a debt to the government under those circumstances? And even when presented with this evidence, in this chamber, Minister Rushton continued to deny that debt collection was being enforced in Townsville, that robo-debt was taking place in Townsville after the floods. Stuart Robert also claimed uh, that this was a false rumour. Well, this is the same minister who falsely blamed the shutdown of my Gov website on a sober attack, cyber attack. So we'll take his word with a grain of salt. Uh, I would like to see an apology from the Minister for Social Services, and, a, and an apology directly to those residents in Townsville that received debt notices under the robo-debt scheme in the aftermath of Townsville that was denied in this chamber when we knew that it was true, when those residents knew it was true. I also want to see this government do more than give an apology. I want to see them come out and say that they will not introduce legislation to bring back robo-debt. This would be a massive slap in the face for hundreds of thousands of people who have already been targeted by this scheme. Oh, sorry, thank you, Senator Green. <laughs> um, the question is the motion moved by Senator Pratt be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I rise to take note of answers given by Senator Cormann to my question during question time as to whether art matters. And of course, the minister gave a very short response. He said yes, but failed to outline to the Australian people why indeed art matters here in Australia to our community and to the society, particularly at a time when we know the arts and entertainment sector is not only the hardest hit during COVID-19, because of the lockdowns, because of the almost instantaneous shutdown of venues, cancellation of gigs, hundreds of thousands of jobs lost virtually overnight. But of course, it's been Australia's arts and entertainment industry who have also helped us get through these times of crisis, to get through the lockdown. What were Australians doing during the period where everything was closed and people were being told to stay at home. They were watching Australian films. They were watching Australian TV shows. They were listening to Australian music. They were reading Australian books. They were engaging with creativity that has come from the minds and the imagination of 
Australia's creative artists. And of course, the reason why we need to ask this question about whether art matters is because this government has failed to put on the table an industry-specific package to help the arts and the entertainment sector. But of course, we know they're rolling out schemes and programs for other parts of industry, building and construction industry, the home renovation package. They've given industry packages to some within uh, the aviation industry. We know, of course, that their hand-picked, stacked COVID commission is full of people who are friends of the fossil fuel industry who want to see more money for gas and coal. But of course, the hundreds of thousands of Australians who are actually out of work in the arts and entertainment industry have been given nothing. And the Prime Minister did say a week ago that he'd had some revelation that something was needed. Well, where is it? A week on and still nothing from this government. Months and months have gone by with Australian artists and entertainers left out in the cold and still nothing from this government. Venues are closed, businesses are going to the wall. Many of, of course, are the businesses in the arts and the entertainment industry are small businesses. Small businesses that employ a handful of people, gig by gig. Many of those people don't even have access to JobKeeper, let alone an industry-specific package that's desperately needed. So yes, art does matter. It matters a whole lot. But this government fails to recognise that and fails to do anything about it. And of course, let's look at those industries where they have put money in. They're pretty blokey. They're pretty much in line with what the Prime Minister likes. He likes his, likes his footy, he likes his home renovations. You know that construction and building industry employs 14 per cent of their workforce is women. 14 per cent of those who work in the building and construction industry are women. Who has lost their jobs in this crisis? The majority of workers who have lost their jobs in this crisis happen to be women. They're, they're industries that have a high number of female participation. <laughs> More women have lost their jobs during COVID-19 than men. And where is the money and the support for those female workers? Well, we know the arts and the entertainment industry. It's 50-50, the gender split. What else has the government done? Oh, they've cut the support to childcare. More women in jobs. And then the women who need the childcare in order to get back into the workforce, well, it's going to be even harder for them. So I ask the question, does the government care about the arts? Well, that's debatable. Does the government think arts jobs are real jobs? There's a big question mark over that. And does the government think women's work is worth it? There's a very big question mark hanging over that question. Jobs for the boys and not, not many for the women. The question is the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it.